maybe I'll start by introducing Rosa while she's uh, setting up. Uh, I'll keep the introduction short uh, because you're tired and I'm obviously tired. Um, so I think one of the key things to notice about Rosa is that um, she actually did a PhD in cognitive science at uh, MIT, but then she realized something I think early on, uh, what many people realize after a lifetime of academic research, that it's very important to do philosophy. So rather than just trying to do philosophy, she actually did another PhD uh, in philosophy at NYU. And I think recently she joined uh, Indiana University as well. So um, best of luck. Uh, she is interested in uh, many things pertaining to uh, cognitive science, philosophy of cognition, philosophy of biology. And much of her uh, recent work is on uh, information, in biology, and cognitive science. Uh, for anyone interested in some introduction to some of the key problems in uh, cognitive science, I would recommend maybe signaling in the brain, a relative uh, uh, article. And today she's going to talk to us about informational explanation, subject independence, and functional specialization. Thank you. Um, okay, so uh, one question that I guess I've been thinking about for a long time is why is information special? Right. Why are we having a whole conference about it? Why is it the subject of so many different papers from people in very different areas? Um, and I'm just going to try to tackle one aspect of that question, um, divided into two parts. So the first part is, um, I'm going to call the ontological question. So how is information different from other resources for a biological system? So I, I agree with lots of what's come before that information is a resource, for example. But the question is, how, why is it not like food? Why is it not like clothing? Why is it not like shelter? What's special about information? And the second part I'm going to call the epistemic question, and that's the question of why information is different from other explanatory resources for a theorist, for someone who's trying to explain a system. And I'm thinking that uh, there's a special need or a special aptness to an informational explanation in some situations, um, applied to some systems, but not in all situations. There's a special subset of things that call out for informational explanation. So to sort of make the job of answering these questions easier, I'm going to just consider the information in signals. Right, so signal, and I'm thinking of signals as intermediaries, um, either between parts of the same biological system or as uh, signals traveling between distinct individuals. And I won't be talking about other kinds of information like structural or physical information. Um, and you might think of the kind of information that I'm talking about today as minimally semantic natural information. So it's correlational information between a signal and some state of affairs where the information carried by the signal is about that other state of affairs in some very low key way. And I'm going to need to distinguish between signal vehicles, on the one hand, um, the physical stuff of the signal, and the signal contents, which is the information carried by the signal. So all things that other people have said already. OK, so how is information special for the system that uses it? Well, it's a resource for dealing with a special subset of problems, coordination problems. So complex organisms need to coordinate their parts and processes, um, whether it's in motor control or matching um, behavior to the environment and perceptual guidance of action. Um, maybe they need to work together with other organisms. All of these are cases of coordination problems and where there are different behaviors or actions appropriate to different states of the world. And uh, the system has to figure out which is the right one to execute. Um, how does it how does it pick the right action given the situation in order to maximize or do well um, given, given its goals? And I'm taking it for granted that the biological systems we're interested in do have goals in some interesting sense. Okay, so quite naturally, I think the theorist adverts to information when explaining how certain coordination problems are solved. And I'm supposing here that representational explanations are a kind of informational explanation, but um, they might have further requirements, and I'm not going to talk more about that difference or what that difference might come to. So here's my proposal. Um, unlike other resources, informational signals are valuable to organisms um, for their relational features. 
so for features of their correlation with distal states of affairs and not the material properties, right? Not the material properties of the vehicle. So as I already said, food isn't like this, clothing isn't like this. And uh, there might also be other ways to solve even coordination problems that are non-informational. So um, yeah, maybe some of you have seen videos of this thing called the passive walker. So that's a thing that solves a kind of coordination problem, right? Um, getting, getting each leg to move at the right time in order to stay on balance. Um, but it does this in a totally uh, passive way where you can say that there's information um, carried in the velocity of the joints and their angles um, about what's going to happen next and what, the, what its current state is, but that doesn't seem to be uh, an explanation that gives you something extra in the way that um, maybe ascribing contents to animal signals gives you something extra. Okay, so here are, um, here are two tests. And my proposal is that when a signal seems likely to pass these tests, the theorist um, adverts to information in order to describe the signal's contribution to the functioning of the system. So the first test I have nicknamed the swap test, and that's that the resource, the signal, would maintain much of its value uh, even if we change the vehicle, as long as we maintain the correlation between the signal and the relevant states of affairs. Second test um, comes from Nick Shea uh, in his meta representation paper, and I've nicknamed it the wiggle test. And that's what, where if we were to strengthen the correlation between a signal and what it carries correlational information about, the system should exhibit greater success in its task. And conversely, if we were to break the correlation, then the signal would do, the system would do less well in paying attention to the signal. And it's called the wiggle test because the idea is that you, uh, you have the correlated thing on the one hand, and if you wiggled that and you have a strong correlation, then uh, the things that respond to the information in the signal should wiggle as well. Okay, so uh, what about for theorists? So I'm thinking that informational explanations, one of their sort of uh, distinctive features is that they abstract away from physical properties of the vehicle in the explanation. And um, so when we're, when we're trying to give an explanation that's more general than one that appeals only to physical features of a vehicle, um, sometimes we abstract away from properties and that leave just relational ones behind. And sometimes we abstract away from physical properties to get to informational properties. Other times we might abstract away from detailed physical level stuff to less detailed physical level stuff. Um, Information is just a different way of abstracting away from some details that seem to be inessential. And so inf explanations invoking information are going to be robust to changes in the vehicle. They're abstracting away from um, details of the vehicles, but they're going to be sensitive to changes in correlational facts between the vehicle and the relevant states of affairs. So in this way, the explanations match the phenomena. Like the phenomena, they're robust to changes in the vehicle, but sensitive to changes in correlations. And the last thing is the, is the condition that I think is maybe the most important um, for my purposes today, and that's that information is sort of paradigmatically substrate, independent, and multiply realizable. Right? That's, that's a distinctive feature of um, information in explanations. And that's not really surprising, sort of the, the very idea of a vehicle content uh, distinction requires that we think of information as something that could be carried in many different vehicles. Um, and I'll just say one more thing, um, especially in the philosophy of mind, once we've given an informational explanation, uh, the inference to, and thus this system is multiply realizable, um, is almost automatic. And I think this kind of inference um, will only be valid if we're judicious in applying informational explanation to systems with multiply realizable functions in the first place. So I'm going to spend the next part of the talk sort of um, trying to spell out what it takes for a system to be multiply realizable in this way that calls out for informational description. Okay, so what kinds of systems call out for informational explanation? But I've said so far, um, they should be solving some kind of coordination problem uh, using a substrate independent mechanism that exploits correlations between signal vehicles and states of affairs. 
So that sort of brings the two questions together, brings the ontological and the epistemic questions together. Um, and now I want to try to spell out what kinds of systems these are. Uh, there are systems with parts that, that perform multiply realizable functions. And what does it take to be this kind of system? Well, I think that they need to be modular. Uh, they need to exhibit a certain degree of functional specialization and functional separation. So substrate independence, like everything else, um, comes in degrees. But these are conditions, um, these three little ones here, I'm thinking are ones that make it easier for a function to be multiply realized, and thus for the signals involved in performing the function to be relatively substrate independent. So the first one, I think, is pretty obvious. Um, functions impose constraints on realizers. So you can't, you can't make a skating rink out of just anything, right? It has to have the right kinds of material properties in order to fulfill that function. But it is supposed to be the case that you can make a vehicle, an informational vehicle, out of anything, as long as the channel and the receiver uh, working together are able to extract the correlational information. So maybe the thing has to be able to assume a large enough number of states to carry um, a certain amount of information, but beyond that, there aren't supposed to be constraints on what can be an informational vehicle. Okay, the second thing, um, some functional architectures impose more constraints on what physical components can realize functional roles within those architectures than others, right? And the thought is, uh, you know, you could have something that performs a task, and one way to perform that task is sort of all at once with a holistic organization. And another way to perform that task is to have a sequence of steps, um, each relatively simple, um, and then you perform them in sequence and, uh, and you get the same result. And the idea is that when you have a decomposable system like that, um, one that employs a larger number of simpler functions, each of those simpler functions will impose fewer constraints on their realizers. Right, so each sub-function is more likely to be multiply realizable because it's not demanding a great deal from its realizer. Okay, um, the last thing is that functional separation helps with multiple realizability because it limits the degree of interaction across module boundaries. Right, so if you have more, relatively more interactions going on within a module than between modules, then you can swap out a module wholesale, and all you have to worry about are the few interfaces that it has with the adjacent modules. Um, so that makes that module easier to be easier um, to multiply realize. And if that module happens to be one that's specialized for signal processing or responding to information about the world, then that makes it one that's um, that's more friendly to informational explanation, because you think I could just swap this out for something else. So at this point, I just want to note that a lot of evolved systems tend not to have this kind of modular organization. Um, they tend towards pleiotropism, which I think somebody already mentioned, um, because of this phenomenon that Wimsat calls generative entrenchment. So Wimsat says something like, when you have resources that are around all the time, uh, they often get co-opted for other purposes. So like the spandrels of San Marco. They're around, they get exploited. Um, and so you have the multiplexing of many functions on the same infrastructure over time. And there are lots of examples of this. Um, I think the hormones are often good examples. So oxytocin, you know, it's supposed to be the love or the trust hormone, but it also regulates things like um, osmotic pressure. Uh, I think melatonin is another one that has a lot of different purposes, one that, um, that I've been interested in is ATP, which most people know as the energy currency of the cell, but also turns out to be a signaling molecule um, between astrocytes and neurons, and it also gets processed into cyclic AMP, which is this um, incredibly general purpose um, internal cellular messenger. So these are just examples of things getting co-opted for other purposes because they're around all the time. <clears throat> 
Okay, so the thought is if you have um, generative entrenchment, if you have multiplexing of functions onto single substrates, then there's a way in which the biological system is exploiting more of the physical properties of that material, right? It's sort of thoroughly exploiting it. And that makes um, the constraints on possible materials that could play the same functional role that you could swap in for that um, material uh, less likely to exist. It's unlikely that there are going to be things with just the right set of properties for fulfilling the functions of that system if there are lots of different uh, functions and constraints that it has to satisfy. Okay, so one, um, one implication of this might be that um, unless, okay, sorry, let me say one other thing. Um, one thing that comes out of this is that unless you have active selection for specialization, the system will tend towards generalization or holistic um, organization where parts sort of start bleeding into each other. Um, but of course, there are lots of cases where there is selection for specialization. So if you need to do a really good job at one particular task, then it doesn't make sense to have other parts doing it, although you might also have the other parts doing it. It does make sense to evolve um, a particular system that's really good at just doing that one task. And I think some of the paradigm cases of uh, information use in biology are going to be those cases, in particular, neural transmission. Okay, so, so one thing I thought while I was, um, while I was listening to um, Ulrich Stegman's talk was that um, it might be that cue sensitivity isn't as highly specialized as signal sensitivity because there was no evolution for production of the cue even though there was specialized um, selection for producing signals. So that was just one thought. I'd be curious what you think about it. Here's, a, here's a, an example of some of these principles. I don't know if you're <coughs> going to be able to read this, but I'll have a slide with some of them picked out bigger next. So um, this is a table from a paper by Anderson and McShay um, showing some concomitants of functional specialization in different sized ant colonies. And uh, the main take home is that complex ant societies exhibit higher degrees of functional specialization than simple ones. So the simple societies are over here, complex ones are over there, and uh, these are just sort of different features uh, that vary, um, that are either absent or present, or um, there's a lot of or there's a little of, little of in the simple versus complex societies. Okay, so in the complex colonies, you have greater functional specialization, and that translates to um, really interesting features of the particular member ants. So it seems like they have lower individual complexity. So each one is capable of doing fewer things, but it does that one thing very well. Um, and in these complex colonies, there's also a higher use of signals and cues, which makes sense because you might think they have more coordination problems to solve um, after they've done this extreme division of labor and have lots and lots of ants who have to work together. And there's more spatial specificity in the signal sent. So those, in those colonies, uh, the signals that are sent um, have a smaller spatial range, right? So they, they tend to help ants of the same kind communicate with each other, and there's less communication across what I'm gonna call ant modules. Um, there's, there's just enough to get the task done, but there isn't the kind of all-to-all -all signaling that you would have in smaller colonies where you have sort of generalist ants that are capable of doing um, more tasks, but not, um, not, as, not as well and not as efficiently. Okay, so uh, the, point of, the point of the ant colony is to show that when you have this increase in complexity, sorry, when you have this increase in functional specialization, then uh, the system shows some organizational features that seem to make multiple realizability easier, right? There are more functions, but they're simpler, and they're connected up to each other more sparsely. Okay. So here's what I've said so far. Um, informational explanations are apt when the system's solving a coordination problem, and when the signaling apparatus that it's using to solve that coordination problem is multiply realizable. Um, you only get multiple realizability, or at least it's much easier to get multiple realizability 
uh, if you have functional specialization and modularity of the system. And then this sort of explanatory um, desideratum. Informational explanations are best suited to describe modular systems with a specialized information transmission mechanism. Okay, so now I'm going to go through a couple of more examples um, to try to show that modularity and a general purpose informational mechanism makes um, informational descriptions and informational explanations look more appropriate. So here's one from um, Dennett's review of um, Godfrey Smith's Darwinian Populations book. So here's a scenario. Um, I'm sure you could construct it in your head. Um, Urban Alice want to have a baby, uh, baby Hal, and instead of doing it in the traditional way, they instead have their genome sequenced. Uh, they have a little program that does, that runs an algorithm on the genome sequences. They then synthesize uh, the resulting DNA from scratch and stick it in uh, a denucleated egg and make a test tube baby. So Dennett thinks that this example demonstrates that the transmission of genes is essentially informational. Um, because it seems like the vehicle carrying uh, the DNA information doesn't matter, right? Normally it's carried in nucleic acid, but look, he's managed to swap out that part for this completely in silico operation. Um, so it seems like we've satisfied the swap. <coughs> and so the, the only question is whether this is actually going to be something that works. So I'm not sure that this example works because I imagine that there are a lot of biological details like histones and configuration of the genome and so forth that go into determining the DNA implementation, um, this thing, the DNA implementation. And a lot of those details would be lost if we tried to make a baby in this way. But if it doesn't work, if I'm right and it doesn't work, it will be because modularity was violated, right? It's going to be because it turns out that the DNA, the normal DNA implementation is successful, not just because it correlates well with the DNA of the parents, according to whatever the meiosis algorithm is, but also because the vehicle has a particular shape and kinetic dispositions and physical features. It will turn out that the vehicle matters in performing the function for the system. And if it does work, it'll be because the system is modular in this interesting way, where there is uh, this clear functional specialization just for carrying um, genetic information and that, doesn't, that isn't employed to do anything else. Okay, um, I guess I'll say one more thing about this, which is that it's not, it's not obviously a coordination problem, uh, but it does require the system to bridge a gap in space and time. And you could think of that as sort of programmatic information so directing, um, making some future state of affairs more likely on the basis of the content of the signal. And you could also say that Hal needs to coordinate with the environment, and he does so best by this mechanism. But that might be another reason to think that info informational explanation isn't the most apt here. Okay, here's another, here's another example where people's intuitions vary. This one's famous, and it's not biological. Um, but I think it's similar to some homeostatic biological systems. So here's the famous Watt governor, and it's a machine that solves a coordination problem of keeping the flow of steam steady. And there are strong correlations throughout the system between the amount of steam coming out and various uh, physical features of the system, like the angle of the arms and the um, position of the throttle valve and so forth. But it's kind of contentious whether this system is best given an informational description or whether um, it's adequately described with a dynamical or mechanical one and we don't actually gain anything by ascribing um, informational uh, descriptions to the system. So for one thing, there's no clearly specialized portion of the system that's just responsible for acting as a signal. It seems like each physical component whose state carries information about the steam pressure, for example, is also directly involved in action. So there's no separation um, between the signal and receiver. There isn't modularity within that part of the system. And I guess at this point I should say that the, an informational description, um, in this case as in all other cases, um, it's always available, but it's not always um, 
uh, superior competitor to the non-informational alternatives. Okay. On the other hand, um, if you had a steam governor that was described, that was designed um, in this way, it might, you might think it's more informational. So here's a highly um, modular design, and it's suggestively called an algorithm. And you have, you have these steps, right? You measure the speed of the flywheel, you compare the speed, um, you measure the steam pressure, you calculate some things. These are, these are all very informational words. <clears throat> and I think part of the reason they're so applicable here and not so obviously applicable in the traditional case is that um, here there is more modularity, right? There's a separate meter from a device for calculating the speed discrepancy. There's a separate adjuster from the thing that calculates the throttle valve adjustment. Right? There are a sequence of steps, and you could imagine switching out um, each of these parts for another part that could do the same job, but that was made of something else. And of course, if you think this is actually a good description of the original governor, then you should probably also think that an informational explanation of the original governor is appropriate. 
didn't have the same particular physical features. Um, similarly, when you're sending stuff back out from the nucleus, sometimes you're literally sending out uh, parts of uh, parts of receptors, parts of synaptic receptors. Uh, that doesn't. There's a way in which that carries information about what's going on in the nucleus and also what's happened in the past. But it also seems like that thing is helping the cell achieve um, whatever its function is in virtue of being a receptor, right? It seems like the kinds of uh, interchange that are going along this highway are not so much communication as they are something like trade, like sending goods to and from a factory or from a warehouse. So if it turns out that macromolecular transport and all of these other activities that a neuron performs are important to the function of the brain, then it's not going to be the most uh, perspicuous description of the brain to say that um, all it does is process information. Um, it might be the case that it does process information or transmit information um, through these action potentials, but it's also doing these other things that maybe um, are better characterized in biological terms rather than informational terms. And maybe those aren't exclusive, but characterized in squishy, non-informational biological terms, um, rather than these terms that make it seem like uh, it's going to be multiply realized. Signal test, they use signals or signal receiver setups that are multiply realizable, so they pass the swap test. And uh, it takes a special kind of system, one with modular organization and functional specialization to pass both of these tests. And, uh, okay, I'll say one more thing to sum up. So calling something information is a way of picking out a physically disparate group of difference makers in virtue of their playing the same functional role within a system or potentially playing the same functional role within the system. And so explanations that unite these disparate things under the same name, under the same functional description, an informational one, are going to be more robust and general than those that only invoke one of them. And they're more efficient and tractable than those that disjoin a whole bunch of ones that don't seem to have other, uh, other physical features in common. So if they're able to play the same role, functional role despite being physically diverse, uh, that role must be relatively substrate independent. And if you're trying to give an explanation that's at exactly the right level of generality, right, that's not too general, but that's not too narrow, um, it seems like information will be really apt there. Um, if, on the other hand, there's a set of possible difference makers that are physically very similar to each other and only manage to do what they do in virtue of the physical features that they all share, then it might be that an explanation that picks them out in, in virtue of their informational content, uh, but not their physical features, is not going to have explanatory advantages over, ones that, over one that just picks, out, picks them out by their common physical features. Okay, last thing is that um, everything I've said, I think, is a matter of degree, and so then is the aptness of informational explanation. I don't think there are going, ever going to be any purely informational systems, except maybe in mathematics, um, but Lots of systems will have informational aspects, but maybe not as many as we would like for ease of explanation. And that's it. Okay, we've got ample time for questions. Well, okay. Well, okay thank you. Uh, I think you. Uh, Associated information with two features that I'm not sure that always go together. One is, uh, you know, the, the idea that uh, um, information has to do with relational uh, information properties are relational properties, and they. Uh, and then it, you said also in the sense that. Also, the abstract uh, away from physical properties. So, so this is like one thing, and the other thing is the modularity. Uh, I mean, you, you said it's more reasonable to find, you know, uh, information and kind of explanation yeah. in modular systems. And 
Uh, I'm not sure it, it, it goes together. I mean, it, it's true uh, in some sense, uh, you would say, and, and then of course, the, uh, multiple realization plays a role in you know taking the information to the modular side. But, uh, but you assume here that if something is relational or abstract away from physical properties, it's, it is multiple, uh, multiply realizable. And, um, or some, uh, uh, but I'm not sure that it always go, uh, goes together. So for instance, you can take, I don't know, universal Turing machine, okay? Or something like this. So I would say, yeah, I mean, in the first sense, properties being relational and not dependent on physical properties, right? It's inf an information system, and we see it as an information system. Also, like, you know, a non-modular neural network, the same, I would think about. Uh, uh, but on the other hand, um, um, so on the other hand, there might, it might be more difficult to have multiple realization here. Um, uh, and so modularity too. So, but still, I would say that the universal Turing machine, for instance, is an information processing system, and uh, that satisfies you, you know the first set of conditions, like being relational and not being dependent on physical properties to some degree. But still, it's not modular. So. Um, uh, uh, so okay. So I disagree. I think the okay. universal Turing machine is modular in the relevant sense. So it's modular in that there's a clear separation between the tape and the processor. And it might be that whatever programs you run in it aren't modular, but I'm not talking about modularity at that level. I'm talking about modularity of the mechanism um, that deals with the information. Okay, and what about so? And the okay, universal Turing disagree. machine yeah, okay. is supposed to be really multiply realizable, like paradigmatically multiply realizable, right? Can simulate it on this. I can, um, I can, I could build one painstakingly out of cardboard and yeah, sure. I mean, Legos. it is, but it is less. Well, of course, it is a matter of degree. I mean, it is less multiply realizable than you know maybe simpler systems because it might require you know more complex relations. But even if we disagree about universal Turing machines, so you, you can think about you know uh, some uh, like huge neural network. You know all the parts are doing the same things, um, the, um, you can uh, use the network for many different things, I would see it as an information processing system, and it doesn't have to be modular at all. So I thought you just said that it was modular. No, no. Uh, so uh, it, has a, it has a bunch of parts, right, and each of, so I think when you say neural network you mean not the biological kind. You mean something with a bunch of units yeah, yeah. and electrical connections that can be on or off. Right. So I think that that's something that does exhibit modular organization in the sense that there's a clear separation between the signal, like the electrical signals traveling through, and the actual units. Um, and there's no, there's only one function that's required. Right? There's, there aren't multiple functions the way there would be in a neuron that had to support both signal transmission and plasticity. I mean, of course there are many components. I'm, so, so I, I'm not sure what you mean by modular anymore. Anyway. Yeah, <laughs> so maybe I should clarify what I mean, what I mean by that. So yeah, by modular I mean... Components. I mean no but I mean other, functional yeah, but specialization. The, right, but each component has exactly the same function in neural network potential. Okay, and, and you know that you combine them together and you have like a system that you can arguably use to teach anything, right? And uh, so, so, so in what sense it is modular other than maybe it's mechanistic, I don't know. But not, uh, right, so I think at the mechanistic level it is modular and at, at more abstract levels of description it's very, like with respect to a particular task then it seems like it's not modular. But I'm only thinking about the mechanistic part. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so I think this follows up on the same point. So, I mean, I'm worried about you, you know, at the beginning you sort of delimit your, you know, topic. You say, look, there are lots of ways of thinking about information and representation, structural representation, functioning homomorphism, blah, blah, blah. But I'm only going to focus on this one specific case. But then you make claims about what motivates informational description across the board. So how can those two parts fit together, right? So I mean, you might think when you look at the kind of 
you know, systems within a computer, it's function, you know, it's using binary or something. Correlational information, maybe this doesn't even gain traction there. That might be an issue. But then when you think about the wiggle test and you know, this other test might not even apply. It's unclear, you know, there's such a degree of organization and that, that you can't just like swap, you know, symbols and binary around without having to change all of the algorithms that are running on the system. So, so there's a lot of kind of constraints. I mean, there are many constraints given the way that the sign system is organized, and that's characteristic of this particular kind of representation, you know, a homomorphic system. So I wonder if, you know, by focusing only on a special set of cases, you're actually limiting the, like, kind of applicability of your analysis here. I mean, multiple realization, you know, might take on less importance in those cases, and yet they strike us as paradigmatically informational systems, maybe for some other reason. Okay, so yeah. it's, it sounds like what I should have said to Oran was, those are biological cases. I shouldn't say anything about them. So that's one response. But I think the second thing I want to say to you is that um, computers, these artificial systems, are modular in exactly the way that I think most biological systems aren't, unless there's been special selection for specialization. Right? Even though at the level of a program, um, or at the level of a particular representation, it seems like that representation is distributed over you know, lots of different physical parts of the system, uh, nonetheless, as with the Turing machine, there's this clear separation between the memory storage and the RAM and the different processor pieces. Yeah, I agree with that completely. But let's go through your three, you know, conditions here. Yeah. Suppose the swap test doesn't really work when we're not talking about correlational information. So we have some kind of homomorphism or something yeah. like this. Maybe the correlational information doesn't sort of apply there. And what's the other test? The wiggle test? I don't think that means Where you increase the, yeah, so it's so only for correlational information. So yeah, so we're left with functional specialization, but, you know, that's going to be way too general. I mean, doorstops are, you know, multiply realizable and things of this sort, but, you know, we're not Right, but they're not about, parts yeah, yeah. of systems that have goals. So when, so I thought when you were talking about okay. um, computers and so forth, you were talking about computers doing the same kinds of tasks, solving the same kinds of problems of what to do in this situation, given this environment that I was thinking the biological system were. And if that's not what they're doing, yeah. then you're right, I have nothing Can to I say about Can I give you the one biological example? So, I mean, take, take a case, a kind of switch in a cell, you know, uh, if, you know, it's on, this other thing yeah. happens, if off, the, the other thing happens. You might think of this as a kind of like permissive causation, but then you might think of instructive causation, so there's a kind of, you know, Fine Make this thing. Right? <laughs> yeah. And so you might think, well, look, if there are 100 values of this variable and they pick like 100 values in some other variable, this is a kind of distinctly informational type of relationship. Biologists tend to sort of, you know, talk yeah, about so those Yeah, so I think cases. biologists talk about those cases in informational terms. But that seems terms. more functionally constrained. Yeah, than and the I case don't think that they, and I think that they shouldn't talk about okay. those. Okay. In fun or when they do, they don't mean the same. It's not a good informational explanation for the same reason that I think the cases I talked about are good informational explanations. Okay. They're using information for some other reason. But Maybe that Arnon might, yeah. um, has better explanations That might that. be the same sense of information which gains traction in these other cases of representation, like structural you know, representation. I do, so I'm not convinced yeah, that yeah. they do gain traction. Yeah, yeah. Okay. This is okay. the okay. only okay. one I'm sure of. Okay. Yeah, I have a couple of comments. One is about this popularity thing that came up. It seems to me like you're talking about it in um, terms of um, the physical separation of parts and the possibility of swapping out in and out um, yeah. actual parts of the system. I think I actually think that it would be much more helpful for you to speak in terms of kind of causal modularity in a kind of Woodward sense, where uh -huh. the idea is it's modular if it's possible to play around with one variable and not have everything else go variable. haywire. Yeah, yeah, I think that's. First of all, some of your examples, the DNA example, for instance, um, I think that's what's playing the role there. Not so much whether histones are physically separate, but you know whether there is something about how the system works that depends not merely on the sequence of DNA, of bases in the DNA, but also on other features. Right? And I also think that's the right notion because that's the notion that's relevant from an evolutionary perspective. The question is whether there is a you know. A, selection regime that could alter these properties without altering those yeah. properties, yeah. not about whether you can actually, can actually be detached. Uh, so that's one comment. I think that would help with some of these examples. 
Yeah, I really like that comment because I think I think that is what I'm trying to get at, and yeah. I was just thinking of the physical separation as a good heuristic for right. it. It's interesting too that in in Woodward, and this is a side comment on that, there there was a, a point. Well, maybe I should leave that aside. It's too too much of a detour. But but the other thing is also related to expo to to your sort of the way you talk about explanation is I think uh, somewhat unusual, right? Because many people see explanation as a Objective category, essentially as a, you know, capturing the causal relations, that, this can't be what you mean, right? Because you want to say, well, there are multiple explanations here that are uh, applicable, that capture the same set of physical causal facts, but some are more apt than others. And that notion of aptness seems to, to, to be related to your, uh, to the explainer in some, some sense or other, right? It's the biologist or whoever that, as an explainer, finds this kind of description more apt. Now, there you could say something objective, right? It's not just a matter of whim or of sort of pragmatic aims. There's something about the system that makes this description more apt. But you're also acknowledging that other descriptions would capture the same set of facts, just less. So, I mean this. This could be, we can press on this and, and ask, you know, I mean, I'm kind of sympathetic to this sort of notion of explanation, but I think it's unusual. It's not the standard notion and, and, and this kind of, it's not just a It's not ontic explanation. explanation. It's like Strevens type explanation with the whole first part thrown out. I, I don't know about Strevens. Uh, I, mean, I mean, whether, I mean, whatever. But it's just, it, there is that. Yeah, so you're right. I'm absolutely thinking of explanation as this here, thing that we do. Yeah, some of the objections are going to be objections that have a mind a different notion of explanation. It's not just what the set of causal facts is. Yeah. yeah, I think that's right. Well, I don't think there's going to be time to discuss this, but I'll just mention it as a type of example that I think isn't covered, but I suspect is important for at least one biological species. It's information about uh, what's possible or impossible or necessary implications as opposed to correlations. For example, um, some humans know that one-to-one -one correlations are transitive. If A is set A correlated B and B with C, then A with C and various other things. Yeah. Hershey uh, seems to have shown in his research on children that kids don't really understand don't grasp that relationship, don't understand, don't get the information about transitivity until they're five or six years old. And I wonder if, A, that sort of information, you've got a type of relationship, and some other type of relationship, and you get a relationship between those relationships, and that's not a statistical regularity or anything that's most likely, it's something else. What kind of thing, biological mechanism could support that? But that's probably too big for a discussion. I don't think it would fit your criteria, but maybe you'll say, yes, I've missed something. That's what do you know what I mean? Uh, I'm, so I'm not completely sure. Um, it, sounds, it sounds like even though it's the nature of this thing isn't correlation, uh, observable correlations will follow from oh, yeah, this. It's a and so, connection yeah, which will generate, which will generate which observable is, correlations yeah. which the children can then test, latch on to. It seems right that they don't have a mathematical grasp of the structure, but I'm not sure. So I'm not trying to explain something like human knowledge. Well, it's information about a feature of relations in the world. Yeah, I have no story about that. Okay. Yeah, it's a little bit related to what Ron said about the, the modularity being a kind of a, should be defined in terms of functional modularity. Yeah. Sort of. Uh, so it's not a structural feature. Of, of, the, of the element, but it's the functional feature of the element which should be a modular in order to allow for multiple realizability. Yeah. And the other thing that, so I think this is the, and I think what is interesting about this, I think that the point that you have made about modularity, uh, a modular system, modular in this sense for me, uh, to be in, in more easily multiply realizable and therefore sort of allowing us to talk more easily about relations which are uh, not too tightly related to a particular, particular kind of realization. I think it's a, it's a valid question. 
oh, oh, but I want to say something here about how, how do you diminish this system. So one of the things that we know about biological system, is, so if you're looking at, uh, let's say, cell types in the body, and you're looking at dif differentiated cells. Now, for sure, there are very, very, very many differences. If you are looking at the details, or the molecular details of the liver cells, they're yeah. very different from each other. Yeah. Nevertheless, they're all liver cells. Yeah. So in spite of those differences, there is a huge commonization. Yeah. And so, again, so if you're looking at the micro, uh, at the micro level, this, is the wrong, this would be the wrong level to look at, at the, the modularity. The micro level would be absolutely the wrong level. And the higher you go, in most cases, not always, but the higher you go up the hierarchy of biological organization, the more variability you have at the lower level and the less variability you have at the uh, up, upper level because of, modula of canalization. Because you, you have to have canalization because the, the, th the system has to function. It's a complex system. So it has all the time to compensate yeah. for noise, for whatever, everything else that is going on there. and. Uh, so I think that the description, that when you're talking about modularity, you have to define at what level you are talking. Yes. And, uh, and, 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 uh, and once you do that, I think that you can talk about, uh, about bits being, about parts being modular, even in cases that seem not to be like that. For example, neural networks. If we're thinking about neural networks. The level of modularity we're talking about uh, is not the particular network, but it is a network as a unit, the whole network and the functional state of this network is the module. So you are changing the level of description here. And at this level of description you can talk about modularity. Maybe you cannot talk about modularity within the system. But between systems, so, so I, I think it will critically depend on the level at which you describe your system. Yes, I agree. And I should be more clear about that. But I, I think I I do want to say that I'm not, I'm not completely sold on this um, functional characterization anymore, even though I thought I was when Arnon suggested it, because um, I don't want it to be trivial, right? I don't want it to be the case that um, if you see an interesting set of behaviors and you can pick out um, different functional decompositions of that behavior, that you can then just say those functional decompositions are are a true fact about the system without knowing anything about how it's organized physically. No, uh, I think that you define sort of, uh, you define information in terms of organization, so it cannot be completely. Uh, and the other thing I wanted to ask you, but that's, it's a little bit not, uh, not 100% related to what you were saying, but I, but I found it interesting. When people talk about modularity, they usually, in biology, very often they're talking about the role of modularity, for example, for vulnerability. Yes. And uh, I was wondering how you find the relationship between the vulnerability and your notion of information, which I think exists, in fact. Uh, between evolvability and my notion of information. Well, yeah, yeah, so I think that, um, that in order for, that organisms, biological systems, have to evolve the capacity to deal with information. So they have to evolve a particular module for the express purpose of dealing with um, these kinds of input and exploiting these particular features. So maybe that doesn't answer your question, but we can talk about it after. We've got two more questions, but I'll abuse my role as a chair uh, and ask you two quick questions and I'll hand over to them. Um, so firstly, to also get uh, um, Gualtiero waking up, um, is it right that on your, on your view, basically, any uh, computational system, biological or not, is a paradigmatic case of um, processing correlational information in your terminology? No, I think it depends on what it's doing, right? So if it's just, if it takes no input, then, right. and, you know, produces no, no output, then it's not. But if we take Turing machines, neural networks, uh, I don't know, end colony computation, etc., then in that case... I mean, I don't think Turing machines take take input from the outside world. Before when Oron was asking the question about the universal Turing machine, I was under the impression that there was modularity and on your view it was an information processor. I think it's an information processor with respect to modularity, but if we're talking about solving a coordination problem by using correlational information, it yeah. doesn't seem to be the right kind of system. Okay, and uh, also you, you, you did emphasize before that uh, you're using the notion of correlation and information, but it seemed to me like uh, 
at least in the background, you presuppose some notion of a receiver in all these characterizations. I'm wondering if that's right or not. Yeah, because I'm presupposing um, a system that's making use of the signal. So um, that can, that's like a receiver, but I don't think it has to be exactly like, a, like the kinds of receivers that Jess talked about. Thank you. Forward? Um, yeah, I don't, this is probably a request for, for clarification. Um, so, so one project is, is an epistemic project which is about what makes um, informational, explanational descriptions appropriate yeah. or, or degrees of appropriateness. Yeah. Um, and can you say more about when you judge, you know, what's the basis for judging that, one, that these criteria pick out degrees of appropriateness? Is it, is it to do with that you gain some some ex a specific explanatory power, or is it intuitions about what what we tend to think? Uh, you know what, what seems to us um, you know strikingly informational case. Or, so just what is the what sort of criteria are you using there in the background to make those judgments? So, on? Um, so I'm thinking that there is a theory of explanation out there, even if I don't know exactly what the right one should be and that it tracks, it tracks the standard theoretical virtues like simplicity and informativeness and efficiency and tractability and so forth. So, um, so yes, I think that um, the aptness is, uh, does correlate with our intuitions about what makes for a good explanation, but it's also supposed to track something like the explanation is at the appropriate level of generality and that's not supposed to be just Opinion or intuition. Yeah. Yeah. Last question, Mark. Yeah, so thanks. So thanks for the great talk. So, so that's probably also a clarificatory question. So, so when you presented this swap test, so was that supposed to be only? Uh, I mean, I, I took it that it was not just a useful tool for discovering what kind of things are representations of signals or uh, you know where information plays an important role, but it was also kind of. Uh, ontological idea that only when a system passes this test can be said to, you know, carry information down. I think that's actually, that was actually more to address the epistemic side. So when a system passes the swap test, then it seems like using an informational explanation will give you something extra, some extra explanatory purchase that you yeah. wouldn't get with I mean, one, one a non-informational one. Just as, so one concern about this robustness condition. So yeah. uh, to me it's not obvious that that's, um, you know, um, relevant or necessary. I mean, you might think that um, all things are relevant, right? For instance, you know, if, if, if you have to send a signal in a very noisy channel, you know, you have to make the signal with very specific features. Yeah. And it's not like, it maybe it doesn't pass the robustness, uh, you know, test. You know, you cannot swap it easily to another kind of signal. That doesn't mean that... It's yeah, not. so that's why I said um, you want to be able to swap either the, the signal or the sort of ensemble of signal and receiver and channel. Uh -huh. Because I, I was thinking signals always have to be appropriate to their channels, and maybe you can't change signals without changing the channels. But there should be that piece that you can take out of the system and replace with a different one that fulfills the same function. Yeah. Okay. So I would like to discuss more about this kind of robustness. Excellent. So tomorrow, um, 4.30 to 5.30 or something like that, we've got an opportunity to discuss uh, at length, but in Jerusalem. Thank you again.